Hi everyone, this is Major Manik and welcome to another podcast of Major Squad. First of all, thanks everyone for your massive support and encouragement on our first podcast. And even bigger thanks to all of you for your suggestions. We are trying our best to learn and improve as we go ahead. And soon we will be launching our YouTube channel also, where all our podcasts will be available. Anyway, today we are going to talk about Rafals, the biggest new arrow in our Air Force quiver. What makes it so special? And I'm going to play the role of host today. I'm just going to moderate because like you all, I just want to sit back and learn from the experts here. Our guest speaker today is squadron leader Anshuman Mainkar, who retired from the Air Force after having served as a fighter pilot for 11 years. He rode the skies with MiG-21 and 27 and worked with the air intelligence also. As ex-NDA, he's from same squadron as me. It may, gives me a lot of happiness to say that we both are from Lima Squan. And as they say, if NDA is a jungle, lions are the rulers. So happy to welcome another lion here. Thank you so much for the invite, sir. Happy to be here. Thanks, thanks. Next we have is Shwetaab Singh, who is a defense observer with a special interest in air power. He also writes for YU Aerospace and is a founding member of Indra Networks. Welcome to the podcast, Shwetaab. Thank you, sir, for having me. So, Anshuman, if you don't mind, I'd like to start with Shwetaab. Sure, sir. So, Shwetaab, tell us what is Rafal. I mean, every Indian is very happy and excited about Rafals. But what it is, I mean, help us understand why is it so special? Uh, thank you for your question, sir. The French Dassault Rafale, which first flew in 1986, got introduced in France in 2001, has finally reached India in 2020. It's a twin-engine plane with canards and delta wing configuration. Physically, it's a bit bigger than both the delta wings that we have in service, the Mirage 2000 and the LCA, but it's a lot smaller than the behemoth that is Sukhoi 30 MK. It is about the same length as that of an F-16. A uh, plane is a shell without its engines, so without its soul, and so is Rafale. Rafale is powered by two Safran M88s, each of them rated at 75 kilonewton thrust. Now, these aren't individually, uh, these aren't the most powerful engines out there, but together they pack a punch. Rafale has a maximum speed of Mach 1.8 at higher altitude, not the fastest in inventory. Actually, it's uh, on the lower bracket, but uh, it can maintain a maximum altitude of 50,000 feet. Uh, but the engines uh, are amazing in that uh, Rafale on its 14 stations can carry a payload of about 9.5 tons. That's about a ton, 1.5 tons higher than that of the MKI, which has a capacity of about 8 tons. Now, uh, the engines are also amazing in the fact that uh, they allow Rafale to super cruise. Super cruise means basically maintaining supersonic flight uh, without actually engaging the afterburners or reheat, right? Uh, it can maintain super cruise at Mach 1.4. Oh, very few aircrafts in the world can actually do that. It's the F aircrafts like the F-22, the Sukhoi 35, Gripen, Typhoon, and Rafale are the ones that can actually do this. So yeah, that was the introduction for Rafales from me. Thank you, sir. Okay, that, that was a great technical summary. I hope you all got you know, some understanding on why certain features are so special. So, Anshuman, if you don't mind, uh, you know, uh, I'll just bother you now. Tell us why this, I mean, taking from this summary, as a layman, we all understand a fighter plane is a fighter plane. I mean, we already have great ones like Sukhois and MiG-29s and now Tejas. Why is Rafale so special from your perspective? What makes it, what as a plane makes it so special? Uh, thank you so much for the question. So, uh, first of all, I think what makes it so special is uh, that it brings a host of capabilities that were not available before. Uh, things like super cruise, the engines that he spoke of, I mean, they are a work of marvel. Uh, it has, uh, it can perform different roles. It is more versatile. It can carry more payload and it can complement the different aircraft that we have in a very good seamless manner. Other thing, of course, is that uh, being the 0.5 uh, plus generation to uh, some of the other platforms, including uh, the Mirages and the MiG-29s, we can hope to network it in a much better way, right? That is how we can best leverage the long-range weapons that it has. And so it will give us better reach as well. 
Apart from that, I think uh, the other implication that not many have spoken about is uh, the strategic role that it can play. The certain number that we procured, it can take over the nuclear role also. And that speaks about the great amount of dependence that we will have and also the great amount of assurance that the platform gives us. So in terms of maintenance, in terms of uptime, in terms of the versatility, in terms of complementing, I think it's a, a very uh, successful platform which has proven itself in combat elsewhere. And uh, it'll do a world of good in terms of uh, integrating with uh, the forces that we have and taking the battle to the next level. Thanks. Okay, Th thanks Anshuman. So uh, I'll just come back to you Shetab now. I mean, a plane it itself is just a platform, like the term, you know, Anshuman used. Right. Uh, what gives it real lethality is the arsenal it can carry. So uh, we've been talking a lot about meteor missiles and we've been talking of range of other hosts, uh, range of other missiles and radars that are with Rafal. Can you give us a brief on uh, all those? Right, sir. So uh, the weapons that Rafal carries, uh, I'll start with the most basic one that any, which is integral to any uh, fighter aircraft, which is its internal cannon. The Rafal carries a 30 mm internal cannon made by Nixter, right? Now, uh, coming on to the air to air missiles that it carries, uh, the Indian loadout that we selected comes with a MICA series missiles of short range air to air missiles. We have uh, the MICA IR and RF, uh, which are all already available on the Miras 2000s and are Sukhoi 30 MKIs. Next is the talk of the town, the Meteor Beyond Visual Range, long range uh, air to air missile. It's an active radar uh, uh, using ramjet powered, a very long uh, range missile of uh, having a range of about 200 kilometers. It exceeds uh, any other missile right now in production in the world. Uh, on the air to ground aspect, uh, it was recently reported that uh, India is deciding to go for hammer class PGMs, precision guided munitions. We already have the Paveways and Spice 2000s, but, uh, and it was thought that uh, it would be the Spice 2000 that would be integrated with the Rafael earlier, but it seems the timing and the cost of the integration would not be feasible for us right now. So it is reported that we will be going for the hammer wheels. Also on the air to ground aspect, we have a very famous missile, uh, missile called Scalp or also, which is also known as Storm Shadow, right? Scalp is an air launch cruise missile that has a range of about 560 kilometers, about 300 nautical miles, right? It is a little higher than the Brahmos Ace, which will be entering service soon with the Sukhoi 30 MKs also. Now, uh, this gives uh, Rafael obviously a very good standoff capability. And uh, now there is also talks about the fact that uh, we might be integrating the Exocet anti-ship missiles with the Rafales, giving them some sort of uh, anti-ship missile capabilities also. But that has obviously not been confirmed as of now. In future, we might also see the next generation of Brahmos, the Brahmos NG air launch cruise missiles also get integrated with the uh, Rafales. Now Rafales, uh, why they are interesting also is that they're radar, right? Uh, other than the Jaguars, which are in process, uh, Rafales are the first air aircraft in Indian Air Force's inventory that carry an ASA radar, right? It's the latest generation of radars. Uh, before that, the best ones we had were the uh, PESA type radars on the Sukhoi 30 MKIs, but right now this is the generation I had, right? Uh, now, our Rafals also come with, other than the host of sensors that Thales provides us, with something called AeroSpod. Now, AeroSpod is essentially a recon pod, which is used for uh, taking images and uh, it provides all weather capability and real time data link so that they can share these images in real time with the other platforms and back at the headquarters and other areas. Thank you. Oh, that was excellent. I mean, at least I stand more educated. Uh, Anshuman, uh, one of the biggest conversations around Rafal has been that why it was selected. You know, I mean, to put it in a uh, simple question is right from, you know, 2001 when MMRCA was conceptualized till 2020, when we have these with us, what actually transpired? I mean, from IF's perspective, what made this happen? We would really like to understand that from you. Uh, thank you so much for that question. And, uh, and I think it's, it's a very, very valid question at this moment. 
And uh, over the years, there's been a lot of talk over the MMRCA and the commercials and other aspects, but I think it's good uh, uh, to get back and revise how the requirements came about and after 20 years, where we stand. So first of all, as far as the MMRC is concerned, you know, I think all the contenders were excellent. First of all, they are all market leaders. They are all at the cutting edge and even more, they are future ready. And they are all prepared for the long haul in investing in India. So the kind of future benefits that India stands to gain is amazing. So from a perspective of sharing out RFIs and getting proposals, I think it was the platform that we see were really great. But of course, one had to win. So what went into all of this? So first of all, there are two aspects to selecting a platform. One is, of course, the combat performance per se or the operator perspective where we talk about the desired specifications that the IF requires and what the vendor comes up with, what are his maturity levels, what is the different types of add-ons that he can provide, etc. Then, of course, there are certain conditionalities about India ranging from weather to the ability to plug and play courts type of equipment. So this happens during the technical trials part of it, where we talk about all this performance about the aircraft, the weapons, how it can be used, etc. But then we come into the IF or the centralized MOD type of uh, discussions where you talk about the IP that will be shared with us that we can uh, benefit from later on, where we talk about the AMC or the maintenance aspects and also the performance benchmarking. And that is a very, very crucial aspect because I think OPEX costs are going to be huge and they are justifiably so. So if you recall, I think Mirage is the only platform in the inventory which has retained its camouflage scheme because the friends say that if you mess around with it, then they are not going to guarantee its performance, right? So even small bits like that comes into this aspect because the vendor wants to look good in front of the world that he's trying to sell weapons to. So this maintenance aspect, the performance benchmarking is very important because as we all know, platforms are nothing but computers today. So there's a new version that's going to come out I think the Rafale is already at F3 or it's going to go to F4. So that is something that needs to be discussed. And once that is over, then they get into the CapEx and the OPEX part, the entire life cycle cost, etc. So having done this at the technical trials, the IF MOD trials, the third aspect that is also important that goes into this is the national and political prerogatives. So in terms of uh, if you want to use a platform for special role, will the government, uh, the selling government approve it or not? what will be the end user limitations and other such requirements such as offsets, make in India, et cetera. So it's a fairly complex thing, which then finally goes, drills down deeper into the platform, into the vendor, into the government relationship. And that is how we came up with two aircraft initially, and then we selected the Rafal. So in short, it was about performance. It was about future readiness. It was about commercials, but it was also about geopolitical and domestic prerogatives. So I think pure performance wise was one aspect, but even beyond pure uh, performance, there's a lot of other things that the government, that the IF has to look into because it is going to serve us for the next 20 years plus. So I think that in short is what uh, the entire game was about over the last 20 years. And uh, as far as the upshot goes, we all know about the performance and the kind of check marks that Rafal brings to the table. But there also needs to be mention of the compliments to the team who works at the IF. In 2001, when they came up with requirements to now, when finally we have the Rafale, had this been done in the normal time frame, maybe today we would already have been ready with two or three squadrons in time to face the threat with full capacity. So I think that nobody makes a mention of the kind of work that goes on in the background. And that is important for us to note as well that uh, there are a lot of people at work, they are doing good work in the Air Force, just that a lot of these processes have to be uh, understood. And that is what aircraft purchase makes a lot of, you know, it becomes very complicated and it has such a lot of gestation periods. So just a case in point, in 2018, France has already started what it wants in terms of a Rafale replacement back in uh, further ahead in 2030 or 40. So that is the kind of game that we are looking at and when we talk about how good is Rafale today, yes, it is a great platform, but where does Indian Air Force want to be 20 years from now? And what are we doing to get there? I think that is the kind of narrative that needs to start working from here on. I hope that answers the question, Mark. Oh, brilliantly. That was, that was a great reply. Uh, uh, so now we'll shift 
our gear a little and go back to the Twitter thread that I started around two hours back that we are going to do this podcast. So I'd ask people if you have any glaring questions, if you have some something really you want to understand from these two experts, please post your questions. So I'm going to leave it to both of you. Uh, I'm sure you have selected the question you want to answer. Anshuman, let's hear it from you first. Great. Uh, so I selected uh, Rajnikanth has tweeted and uh, he says uh, he watched the earlier episode and uh, what exactly the IF is positioned in the current world of affairs is his question. And then he breaks it down into is Tejas really formidable and Rafael really a game changer. So um, uh, I think this does cover two or three things. So I thought I'll take this on. Great. Thank you for the question, Rajnikanth. And uh, as far as the IF is concerned, uh, like I just mentioned, there are people at work, they understand the nature of war and they understand where it needs to be. But it needs to be kept in mind that this is a game of long gestation, which has a lot of other implications as well, beyond a platform or its performance. Having said that, I think we are at uh, a place from where we are just going to go on grow. So I think this decade promises a lot of dividends for the IF and with the kind of platforms that are being inducted and with the kind of developments that are happening elsewhere, I think there are a lot of good news that is going to come up in the future, even in terms of the indigenous stuff that we are developing. So as far as IFS position, positioning wise is concerned, it's looking good. Is Tejas really formidable? So I think I'll take both of these questions. You know, I mean, Tejas and Rafael, I will not say they are entirely formidable or game changers, but I'll say they are platforms which then complement the entire system that we have, which includes air defense, which includes ground forces, etc. So that is how the entire picture becomes clear once we know it. Of course, they bring unique attributes to the table. Tejas has its own development history, its own requirement, and the role that will perform will be distinct. Rafael brings in something very new. It will enhance our capacity definitely. And it will also have an edge in the subcontinent for some time to come. But remember that these are transitionary phases. People are constantly competing and they'll be something better. So the, I'll go back and say that, that IF is positioned well and with the right kind of equipment that it has, I think if we have the correct approach and the support of uh, the powers that be, we can evolve into a really uh, good and uh, effective uh, sort of a service. I hope that answers the question. Yeah, sure. And I hope Mr. Rajni Kant is satisfied with the reply. So let's go to you, Shwetab, which is the question you selected and let's hear your reply. Yes, yeah, sir. So the question I selected was from uh, Aniket Deshpande and Joy, essentially. Both of them asking how uh, the Rafael would fit in the bigger picture, as in uh, they are good as individual platforms, but uh, as Anshuman sir also pointed out that uh, Rafael is important because it essentially uh, fits, fills in the gaps of the entire picture, right? So I wanted to uh, go with that, that the fact is that uh, Rafael carries a loads of sensors, like it carries a lot of uh, FSO, it carries uh, aerosports and it has uh, passive detection, IRST, etc, etc, right? It carries a lot of sensors and uh, most of the sensors on, on board are made by Thales, right? Uh, having the same uh, OEM benefits is because that Thales also provides on the Rafal uh, something called modular data processing unit, which is essentially their mission computer, which uh, essentially uh, integrates this thing. The, the data fusion that happens from all these sensors, a fully automated data fusion, uh, it creates a much better picture and situational awareness for the pilot than any other plane, which might have loads of different sensors from loads of different OEMs and then somehow trying to uh, create an image out of that. Because of the fact that it's same, uh, we have this. Uh, clear and seamless and better and a more complete image in general. Uh, the better, uh, another important part of this thing is that the Rafals are equipped with data links, right? Uh, IF has had experience with data links. We have in, in planes in our inventory which have data links already, but uh, the Rafal also has data links which are compatible with, you know, both NATO and non-NATO standard aircrafts. So essentially if we have a group of, a package of uh, Rafals with a lot of MKIs or other Mirage 2000s, they can essentially act as uh, sensor pack, uh, sensor units for this entire package, gather as much as data as they can, create a picture, and then give this data to the other uh, planes in the, uh, the group or the fighting uh, in the package, which are going to uh, complete their mission, right? So 
because of this uh, this uh, high rate data link uh, which the, uh, the rafals are equipped with uh, they have this secure data link that uh, that can provide this information to not only the uh, planes in the uh, package but also back to the headquarters and uh, yeah back to the headquarters so we can imagine a scenario where uh, one or two rafales are providing a much bigger picture to a larger package of uh, the other strike aircrafts and this goes on to multiply the effects of the uh, planes uh, and the assets that we have thank you thanks shudab that that was really good i mean uh, it all the conversation we had actually was very interesting not only from the perspective of understanding the file as such but it gave a great understanding of how the entire network works generally a layman thinks of a plane in a dog fight kind of a situation that's a limited perspective to a plane versus plane but you made it clear that it is not a two boxes in a ring but there's a whole network of systems that makes air power possible that makes air wars possible so with this note i'm going to say thanks to both of you and also a big salute to all fighter pilots of the indian air force because in my dictionary they are really supermen so thanks to both of you and jai hind thanks for having me sir jai hind thank you so much jai hind